drink. Sheep from all over Lexington and all different churches are hearing the voice. I believe God's raising up an army. It's either Jew or Gentile. Amen. It's either Church of God, Assembly of God, UPC, Apostolic, or none of that. They're just sheep. <laughs> That's going to be this army. This army is an army of sheep. I found out out in the world, and that's who we're trying to reach, aren't we? I found out that they're not really concerned about what denomination you are. They don't really care too much about what church you attend. All they really want to know is what God's doing for you. <laughs> and if we learn to tell them what God's doing for us instead of about what denomination we're of, we'd see a lot more saved. I don't know. Somebody else pat you on the back. And I believe with all, and I know, I know that if there's anybody in this nation today that can stand up and say what Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, and you'll make it, you'll be all right in this brother West. Amen. I had the privilege of traveling with him, and it was certainly my privilege and my honor. The man certainly walks and lives everything he preaches and teaches. And that's something to be proud of. Amen. Amen. All right, I want you to give Brother West and Baby here a great big hand as they come.
made it religious, we've organized it. We have taken the cross and tried to beautify it and decorate it and clothe it in a new air of charisma. When the only power that God has to give you comes through the bloodiness of that cross. We don't want it talked about too much in most of our churches across America because we're afraid it might cause our children trouble. And yet we'll let them watch television on a Saturday morning and, and witchcraft and wizardry. <laughs> People ain't going to preachers anymore. They're calling 1 900 numbers, which are witchcraft. <laughs> We need to get back to the cross. That's the everlasting gospel that's going to save most of you to these last days. Somebody say praise the Lord. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. We've got to get back to that everlasting gospel. And that gospel is to fear God. People's lost the fear of God. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. They speak against prophets. Of course, I will admit that everything that jumps up and says, yeah, I say unto these, not a prophet. We feel goosebumps sometimes and think we're supposed to prophesy. <laughs> Most people wouldn't know what the spirit of prophecy was in the first place. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Nothing should be prophesied that hasn't already been spoken. If the Word of God doesn't back it or substantiate it, then don't speak it. If you hear it, don't believe it. You might say, well, Brother West, what about the thunders of Revelation chapter 10? They shall be spoken, but they've already been heard and already been spoken. Ears have heard them. Not privileged to write, not privileged to tell. And we're going to understand that and we'll know with the Spirit whether that's the right thing or not. It's my say Amen. Amen. But we've got to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, to the people. Somebody say amen. amen. And prophecy is a dangerous thing if it's misconstrued, if it's misused, if it's used for personal gain, for religious prestige and honor. <laughs> I'm getting a cold way. Prophecy, anything God speaks through prophecy today has already been spoken. Hebrews chapter 1. God who at sundry times, divers matters, speaking times past, unto the fathers, by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom he also made the worlds, who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on the high. Amen. Somebody say amen, all right? Amen. Anything that's going to be spoken in these last days has already, it must have been spoken through the mouth of the Son. Yes. 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 So any of these that jump up and say, well, we've got a new revelation. Most of it's a revolution. Amen. And a hallucination. We'll see you in Michael, Texas. You better make sure your saddle's on right. <laughs> Glory to God. We're seeing problems everywhere. And I wish I could tell you tonight, if you give your heart to God, if you serve God, you don't have any troubles. But that's not true. Anybody that's born of woman is few days on this earth and full of trouble. What you've got to do is learn how to deal with them. Learn how to be successful through them. Come on, church. And say amen. Learn how to come out. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? I teach my people how to be a survivor. I won't let them whine around me. I'll build them. <laughs> How you get along? I ain't doing no good. You won't last my service. Amen. <laughs> 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 
hospital, people don't want to go to church. A big, big, a big percentage of church-going people, every time you see them, you ask them, how you get along? I go, I'm all good. I mean, no wonder nobody wants to go to church. Amen. I'm doing fine. Great. They some people never up till they're down. <laughs> you know, there's some people don't feel good till they feel bad. Yeah. They got nothing to talk about if it ain't something negative. Yeah. I preached a message not long ago. I can preach again. I'll about shout up here. You fit in one of two categories most of the time. You either arrive at a sensible conclusion, or you jump to a negative conclusion. Amen. Go ahead and preach that one, preacher. That's a good one. You have to worry about preaching. It'll preach itself. You either, you, by knowledge of God's Word, and, and, and rightly dividing it, understanding it, it will teach you how to arrive at a positive conclusion. A conclusion is the end of a matter. You arrive at the end of a matter before you get to the matter. Right. <laughs> you call things to be not as though they were. Well, get some looks. <laughs> or you jump to negative conclusions. One little stuff that go wrong. Well, it's easy to praise God when the coverage is full. Yes. It's easy to praise God when everything in the world is going right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jumping to negative conclusions. Well, I got my life bill paid this month, but I don't know what I'm going to do next month. <laughs> Why don't you let next month get here? Yeah. You got a whole month to work. And some of you just run around looking for something to worry about. <laughs> you worry when you can't find nothing to worry about. <laughs> I've been preaching 21 years full time on the field, and I have never worried my way out of one problem. Amen. Worry has never helped me a bit. Oh, it used to be a profession. <laughs> I just get mad because somebody wouldn't help me worry. <laughs>
Tommy Guam moved for us because we learned how to sit in front of a mirror and practice looking sad. <laughs> <laughs> go to church and practice looking sad hoping you get called out. I hope I get called out tonight. Is some of you getting called out? <laughs> There's some of you right here tonight, if you do everything that's been prophesied to you, The greatest God ever had on earth. <laughs> Why can't we get to the basics? I, I, I want to sing some more, but I feel like say it. I feel like uh, agitated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hope's a great thing. Is Amen. Well, well, Wes, I just don't want to get my hopes filled up. Well, that's what I came for. You're dismissed. That's what I come here for. If that's not what you want, then you're dismissed. I came to build your hopes up.
I don't want you to miss tomorrow night service for sure. The Lord spoke a message to me that will change your life. And I would really like to be able to preach it tonight, but the Spirit of the Lord is giving me another direction. And I know that lives will be changed. See, there's a people getting ready to come into something so spectacular and powerful. The world has never seen the light that's getting ready to happen for God's people. And God showed me how to get into it. Oh my God. They were there was such an anointing, such a praise in the tabernacles this last week. It was like thunder. And people are being healed and blessed on the power of God. I hope you will come. I hope you'll be able to come and bring your friends. We'll sit them in the floor. We'll sit you before that didn't sit the chair. <laughs> Just easy. But uh, they need to hear. God will bless you. And I'm here to, to leave my heart with you. I'm here to give you everything that God has given you. I don't get to see you real often. In fact, this is the first road trip you've had, isn't it, Dave? Boy, since December, isn't it? Our equipment's all out of whack and tune, so you bear with us. We'll try to have it corrected by tomorrow. I've been sitting in the basement of the office and hasn't even been used until today. Anybody else want to receive the literature by raising your hand? If you finish with that card, hold your hand back up. Let them come real quick and get it. I will be preaching tonight from Hebrews chapter 4. So you can turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Thank you, Jesus. God's a good God. So I said, well, the West laughs and carries on too much. Well, go find your old snooty, muley preachers out there. Because I'm happy. It's one thing about West Virginia. There's a lot of people still praying for me to get saved. <laughs> they really are. They can't understand. I got so tickled the other day. I, I, honestly, I laughed. You know me. I'm just a happy, I'm just, I'm a happy person. I mean, it's not put on, no junk about it, just real. But a friend of mine came up to me, and he's got a, he's a, he's a preacher, and he's got a, a, a fishing boat. <laughs> he all the time tries to get one on me, because he's of a denomination, another, really actually, at least, totally difficult, but he loves me because I stand for the truth. And he came up to me, and he said, I decided on a real name for my fishing boat. I said, you did? He said, yes. He said, I'm going to name it Visitation. I said, well, Visitation? I got kind of tickled. I said, Visitation? He said, yes, that way when they call for me at home, my wife would tell them I'm out on Visitation. <laughs> I said, that sounds about like you. <laughs> I got a good kid out of Okay, anybody else last come? Appreciate Brother Gary. I love him. I love his family. Appreciate uh, the, the people he works with here. Thank the Lord for their cooperation and their love. I appreciate that. And is is right here? Is it is, who's the pastor? Who is it? I, right on the end. Heard a lot about you. And it's all been good. And I thank the Lord for you. We're glad you're here. And I appreciate you so much. And I appreciate your work. And I thank the Lord. Give our pastor for a good time. You, you know, I'll find her in a jailhouse ring where we're preaching. Just find her out on the street corner laying hands on the devil possessed. Or something. But I appreciate her being here. Sister Claypool's been a friend of ours for a long time. I was watching some of our videos not long ago, and I got to look at some of us when we were young. 
<laughs> I, I still feel young. And uh, it's remarkable how some of us have changed. <laughs> but I, you've been my friend for a long time. I thank the Lord for you. I appreciate all of the pastors. Brother Tench has been a good friend for a long time. I love him. I love his ministry. I appreciate you all. Hebrews chapter 4. How many's got your Bible? Hold it up. I want to look at it. Look at that. Lord, look at that. Turn around and tell somebody I'm a Bible toter. There's so many people don't take a Bible with them. Maybe I could preach tonight on people don't take the Bible. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4. So many have the idea. How do I wear our preacher so good? We don't have to take our Bibles. He ain't that good. I ain't that good. Amen. <laughs> you need those Bibles. Amen. Don't get mad at me. I'll go ahead and get mad at me if you want to. You need those Bibles. Amen. You need those Bibles. Talk to church. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4. Oh, this is powerful. Father, bless this word tonight as I enter into your holy and awesome presence. I do not come through my own righteousness or my own holiness or my own abilities. I come through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I come through the name that's above every name. I ask you tonight, God, to bless this people gathered and assembled in this place. May the blessings of the Almighty God be upon their lives, every one of their lives. I plead the blood of Jesus over their hearts and over their minds and over their spirits. And I ask you to use me for the glory of God. To speak as an oracle of God, as a messenger of the covenant of truth. And Lord, that the ministries that are represented here will be so blessed by perhaps words that would be like keys that would unlock the mysteries of the kingdom of God. That we might understand, be able to comprehend, realize the potentials we have in God. If there's a lost person in this building, God save them. If there's a person in this building that's sick, God heal them. And I will give you the glory and the praise and all of the honor. There's none like you. And I thank you for all that you are to me. And I yield myself completely to you. To be used as a vessel, as an instrument in the hands of God. I ask for your anointing to let it flow like a river. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Everybody that believes shout amen. 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 Little ones are with me, aren't they? <laughs> Begin with verse 12, chapter 4, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with verse 12, it says, For the word of God is quick, that means alive, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, God knows the intents of your heart. God knows whether you're real or sincere. God knows if you're not sincere. God knows if you just intend to use it. I've seen people just want to use it. The only time they would go to him is when they need something. Amen. I don't say that to be mean or sarcastic, but that's the wrong attitude. With that kind of an attitude, you'll never gain much altitude. You'll never fly very high with God. Neither, listen to this, here's really the meat of what we want to be getting into. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. 
But all things, everybody say all things. All that's things. you and that's me. That's all of us. All things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That means that there's nothing you can do that God doesn't do. <coughs> Amen. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Didn't say just priest, but a great priest and a high priest. A great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Listen to this. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched. If so, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched, then we do have one that can. That means exactly that. <laughs> With the feeling of our infirmities. He knows about your infirmities. He knows about your afflictions. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, now listen to the text. Lord God, I feel this. Let us, and this that I have to say tonight will not help anyone here that cannot find yourself in that us. I want you to do something. I want you to turn around and tell somebody, I am right in the middle of that us. I'm serious with you, church. Turn out and tell somebody. I am part of that word used there, us. Look them in the eye and tell them, say, I'm in there. Look them in the eye and tell them, say, that's me he's talking about. Now look in the eye and say, that's you and me he's talking about.
So we have lost contact and touch with the realities of God. Now, Paul said here that we need to come boldly to the throne, but it's not the throne that can help you. David said, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. He was one of those hills that helped him. He was somebody in those hills. It's not the throne tonight that can help you. It's he that's seated upon that throne tonight. That's got the power and the authority to help you. I feel him tonight. Tonight I want to preach if I can have some time of the direct relationship between the cross and the throne. You see, the minute a person across the beautiful state of Kentucky has been looking for years for the perfect church Amen. that gets a thin at seven and home at eight. <laughs> If you won't expect much out of me, you ought to just be happy that I'm here. Well, we are, but in a way we ain't. But if you get to demanding too much and go against my nature of being convenient yeah. that I shall look elsewhere, praise God. <laughs> and because of that, literally millions of people across this nation, not just Kentucky and West Virginia, which I know a lot about, have been deprived because they probably don't hear a 10 minute sermon every month. Because if we don't start getting the growing, 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 we're going to be going, going, gone. That's right. I never said that before. I sound pretty good, huh? Where'd that come from, praise God? Yes. And psychology. Yes. People sitting on a chair and you lay on their couch. Making $150 an hour. Yes. And they say, God, I'm expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, we don't need a boom in psychiatry. We don't need to band-aid this thing and call it cure. We need some Holy Ghost filled vessels to have God to know how to touch the hem of his garment and realize that he's got the power to take it. He had yesterday. Thank God that he's still up in the garment. I will set you free. Anybody else that will come close enough to him to touch the hem of his garment. Amen. And because we're hunting for a church, perhaps many times, Where we can get in little clicks. Don't get mad at me now. Go ahead. You love me more than I told you. We get in little. It's easy. Even in our church, it's easy getting wrecked. And the first thing you know, if you're not careful, Satan will be trying to weed out and choke out the authority of the Word of God. Amen. And the only way in this world, and I want you to hear me as I say this next statement, the only way you're going to ever be able to come to the throne where Jesus is seated, to receive the authority and the power and the grace and the mercy that he has to give you everything you ever need in your life to be stable and secure and at peace with God. The only way you're going to ever get that is to have an absolute 
undeniable knowledge of what he did on that cross. Because he that's seated on that throne tonight, that has passed into the heavens, that is seated on the throne of mercy, grace, kindness, and power, forgiveness, and healing, is the same one that knows he's got everything to offer you, everything to give you, but it all depends on your knowledge of what he has purchased, bought and paid for on the cross where he died. Because the same one that's on that throne is the same one that was on that cross. All he has to offer is what he paid for on the cross. And you'll not get it till you are bold enough with daring courage enough and knowledge enough to come beyond all the religious ridicule, all the garbage in, in television and radio, all the phoniness in religion today, and press beyond the crowds and don't worry about who seems to be the closest to it, but touch the hem of his garment and be healed of the power of God. The cross and the throne work together. Jesus was doing on that tree. Amen. It becomes more than just a story. It becomes the reality of your new life. It begins to give you the backbone of spiritualism that will cause you to stand when all hell is raging against you. When your closest friend don't understand you. When your friends and your parents and your relatives turn their back and walk away from you. You can stand there, glory be to God, on Calvary's bloody rugged hill and see the blood running in the splintery wood of that tree. Stand there and know that that cross is empty now. That there's evidence that somebody was slaughtered there, but he's not there anymore. And as you stand there and you begin to realize what that cross means and who it was that died on that tree and the supreme sacrifice and purpose holy sacrifice that was made there and the things he accomplished there in his life his name into the tree and his death and his burial and his resurrection then you begin to get a backbone that will cause hell to tremble and cause devils to, to shake in your presence as you stand there and realize that you can glory in that cross that you can stand there no matter what you've done no matter how many times you've failed no matter how many times you've fallen on your face, no matter how many mistakes you've made in life, you can go to that cross. It doesn't matter if you're white or black or red or yellow or brown. When you get to that cross, you can look at the splintery wood and the blood that's in, down in there in that wood and it'll become surreal to you that you can see it through the eyes of your spirit and your heart. And then when you realize that he's no longer there anymore, you look toward the tomb, he's not there then there's nowhere else to look except up. And when you look up, he is seated on that throne. And he is seated on that throne. When he begins to see you looking up, he begins to know that you're not looking there anymore, but that you're looking at him because he is the throne the throne knows exactly what he paid for on the cross. And you can receive and have everything you need from God because of that relationship. Relationship between the cross and the throne. Because the same one on the throne is the same one on the cross. The same one who has everything to give is the same one who paid for it all. Amen. Amen. You try to get to heaven on your merits? 
my precious darling sweet friend. Amen. You'll never get any higher than you jump. Huh? Well, brother, where's the I'm about to give up? Don't do that. Keep hoping. Yeah. Keep holding on to your hope. Yeah, well, I made a mistake. I failed. Who has it? Amen. Now, don't pay much attention to these holier than thou's that strut around trying to make you think they live good enough Amen. to get to heaven. Amen. Because ain't a one of us in this building tonight can do it on our own. Amen. Amen. Huh? Amen. Not one of them. Doesn't matter how many degrees. I've got two Dr. Divinity degrees. Hasn't helped me to preach a bit. Hasn't helped me at all, to be in fact. I was sitting up there the other day dusting my one of them off. I just want Mark to know I still had it. <laughs> I looked at that thing and I said, thought to myself again, you haven't helped me a bit. But then how could I blame it? <laughs> when I don't use it. You walked up to me and said, Dr. West, I wouldn't know who you're talking to. I think, what? What's going on? I said, don't move. Because it's really not all the time what people think about me that matters. Amen. It's what he is feeling about me. Jesus, I felt that. Don't lose your hope. Don't let people kill you. Well, so and so failed. I just figured if he failed, ain't a chance for me, dear God. <laughs> Forgive them. Yes. Love them. Yes. Hope God turns it around for them. If you're a preacher, don't try to fill your fish tank out of their fish that flopped out on the floor. <coughs> Don't blow in their failures. I'm getting a cold away. Amen. Right. Amen, brother. Don't rejoice in their failures. God. Hold on to your hope. Amen. Do you know what hope is? I didn't know I was going to get into all this. Do you know what hope is? Hope is a heartfelt desire. That there is a possibility of you receiving something. <coughs> Hope is a heartfelt desire with expectancy to receive something. It's right in the middle of faith. <coughs> faith is the substance of things hoped for. And don't let anyone persuade you or convince you to keep your hopes down. That way if you keep your hopes down, they say, if you don't get much, you're not too disappointed, praise God. I feel like smacking their jaws. I just want to grab and just say, don't do that! And some of you know me, I pretty much would. Because first thing you know, you'll be one of those who say, well, I don't want to get my hope filled up because I'm afraid I might get knocked down, dear God. You need your hope. Yes. How many millions across this nation have lost hope? Yes. Oh, hope's a great thing. Amen. Amen. Yes. Come on, church. Hope's a great thing. Yes. There was a little old woman one time. God, I feel that on it. She lived in a city, a famous city called Jericho. She had a very disrespectful job. She just happened to be one of the town harlots. Made her a living selling her body. She would be 
in modern terms, a prostitute. But two of God's people came to town, and she lived upon the town wall. And she took them and she hid them when no doubt all over that city they were searching for those two spies. She hid them, helped them out the window, down the wall of a scarlet cord. A rope. With only one promise. <clears throat> she didn't want any money. <clears throat> But she heard of the terror of the God of the Hebrews. Yes. She had heard how the that nation come across the desert that every time a nation withstood them, God destroyed them and gave the wealth and the spoils of that nation to the Israelites. Yes. She let them know that we've heard what you've done. We've heard about your God. And when you all get here, I know what you're going to do by the help of your God. Are you listening to me? And all I want you to do is remember me and my household. Now that's putting your whole life with a hope that the God of those Hebrews was a God of integrity. God didn't move for her because she was good. And I'm going to tell you something. If most of us would have been there, we'd have said, God, you shut the gun back now. <laughs> but look over here at me and my halo. <laughs> and that's your problem. Yes. Religion across Kentucky tried to teach you that you can be holy enough yourself to make it and you can't even find God. Now, I don't condone prostitution. There's deliverance for it. Amen. But I'm going to tell you tonight that I have really, this is really a, a part of a first to me. I'm going to tell you that God honored her hope yes, he did. in spite of what she was. Amen. I read the New Testament and boy, she made the book in the Old Testament. She was a harlot. In the New Testament, she was still a harlot. <laughs> now some of us Pentecostals don't like that glory to God. <laughs> but it ain't you that's the same. Amen. It's not you that determines who can touch you. Amen. God's not going to use your thesis. God's not going to use your thing. God's not going to use your story to ascertain whether somebody can get into his throne room or not. You can stand and holler to the sky. You can holler to the star trying to get me on the moon and say, God, you shouldn't let him or her in there. But if they come by the blood of Jesus, if they come by the holiness of Jesus, if they come by the righteousness of Jesus, he is not going to listen to you. He is going to let them come right in. Come on now. Amen. You know something about Rahab? She sat upon that wall and all she had to go on was hope. It was spread probably all, all over the city. They're getting closer. And she would sit there in her house and hope. She knew she wasn't holy enough. She knew she wasn't righteous enough. But she hoped that the God of this great people with his matchless integrity would honor two of his people that she helped when nobody else would help. Amen. She was not depending on 
her goodness. She was dependent on God's mercy. There will be those that tell you, if you go to the altar and make one mistake, it's right back to day one. You'll never make anything. You'll never mount anything. And it's browbeat, condemnation, guilt, fear, beat you down, put your foot on and hold them down. And they don't know how to touch the hem of his garment. There's a direct relationship between the throne of God and the cross of Calvary. And when you begin to learn that it will turn your whole world around. Yes, amen. amen. It will cause you to come to God with a new respect. You would never approach Him because you fasted three days. It don't make you good enough. Amen. You fast 30 days and that don't make you good enough. Amen. You don't come to God because you've been this good old way for about 40 years. Praise God because that don't make you good enough. Amen. 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 Let me tell you what makes you ready to get in there where he is. It's when you learn what he did. Yes. It's when you begin to let it dawn upon you and the day spring grow high, come right down inside you and ignites himself in you and the light begins to burn in you and the fire begins to burn and you begin to realize, thank God that he loves me. Oh, yes. In spite of what that devil's been telling me, somebody up there loves me and wants me to touch him and wants me to get in there where he is and he delights in giving me the very best that he has. I have not because I'm not learned how to ask. I don't have because I don't know how to get there. It's because I'm just kind of maybe spiritually blind. I've been there, honey, and I'm still learning today. If I listened to men, I wouldn't have anything. If I listened to people and their opinions, I'd be at home with my feet popped up. But I'm here tonight to tell you that the one seated on that high throne in glory was the one that cried and bled and died on that cross. And I'm also here to tell you that he delights in helping you find grace and peace. It's his good in the pastures that you've never been before. God said my people perish for the lack of knowledge. What God's really saying there is to this message here, He said I've got everything to offer, but so many don't know it. Amen. I've got everything you need, but you don't have to get to me. He does. Amen. Sometimes it's not a prayer line. Sometimes it's your attitude in lifting your hand. It's not worrying about what people think she's going to say about you. It's having a heartfelt love for Him and honor for Him. When you come to the knowledge of the truth and you come to an understanding that I ain't got time to look at this trial. I don't have time to look at this storm. I don't have time to look at this thing that's coming against me. I don't have time because if I dedicate too much time to that problem and that trouble, then I won't dedicate time to praising God for the blessings I've already got. And you start praising Him and you start loving Him and you start exalting Him. And you begin to thank Him for His shed blood. You begin to thank Him for His righteousness. You begin to thank Him for the privilege and the great honor of coming to Him and being made one with God through your attachment to Him. You begin to love Him and adore Him. You just get to the place you get caught up in it. Next thing you know, God gets in your praise. You wouldn't care if the president and his vice president were sitting there. Thank God you start praising God. You praise Him in our hands. Praise God. 
Porcando, ma neanche la cazzo con un animale, ma ci va. 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 Got to go and move you, because some preacher got a horn with you. God bless your heart. I hope you get all bless your heart. <laughs> God's going to move for us. Yeah. We tell that lop here, the devil. Yeah. You tried to throw sand in my eyes. You tried to keep me blinded. You tried to keep me saturated in, in heaviness. You tried to keep me down. You've lied to me. You told me God don't love me. You told me that I'm not important to God. You told me that everybody has more than me, but I'm finding out that God is no respect of persons. You told me that my past is too bad. You told me that I've made too many mistakes, that God's not interested in me. But I'm coming to find out that God has mercy upon me. And he has mercy upon those that are not me. And that I'm just as clean in the sight of God as the greatest part of the field. Somebody who delights in giving good things to me. Someone who takes joy in giving things to me. Don't stand outside. Most people today don't know the spiritual position they have in Jesus. Hallelujah, amen. Amen. He's our propitiation. Yes, he is. Our mediator. Yes, he is. He stands between me and eternity. Yes, he does. Hear me. His mercy is bigger than my Failure. Amen. Yes, it is. Amen. His blood is more powerful than all my sin. Amen. Hallelujah. His grace is greater than all my failures. And all my shortcomings. Amen. And all my mistakes. Amen. We don't need another preacher with a finger that looks 20 feet long. <laughs> Put people in hell because they fell and tripped and stumbled. We need somebody that will reach down and pick them up by the back of the shirt collar and drag them to Calvary. Thank you. 
God in my soul tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Make you victorious. Yes, it will. You'll become an asset instead of a liability. Amen. You'll help some churches spiritual financial statement. <laughs> huh? God told me, he spoke to me just a few days ago. Told me after all these messages I've preached and all these things I've taught these churches up in West Virginia that most of my people still didn't know how to praise him. Now I've got the awful, hard task of getting that over to me. Because most of them wants to come in and say, I'll uh, clean my headlights off, please. And yeah. Wipe my windshield off and check my own filler up. <laughs> well, I'm out of the full service business. I'm in self-service. And if you want to get to work, I'm getting to the thing begins to become part of you and you begin to walk around no chill bumps so what I don't even feel saved half the time if I with my feelings amen only God knows God. but we don't walk with feelings we don't walk by sight we walk by faith we walk by faith. Yeah. We walk by hope. Yes. If God could justify and preserve the whole family of Ray have a heart because she had hopes that the God and the integrity of the God of those Hebrews would help her because she helped them. How much more? Should we seek to understand the greatness of this Jesus? If the blood of lambs and goats and bullocks and the ashes of a heifer were powerful enough for the sanctification of the flesh, and God would steady his hand, when that representative of the people went beyond the holy veil by the golden <coughs> altar into the holy of holies to stand in a place where he met God for the people and God met him. I'll get into that tomorrow night. Amen. You ain't never going to do the same again. You want to run devil's crazy. All right. Praise the Lord. If the blood of goats and lambs and books and the ashes of an heifer were that powerful, that old covenant to justify, cleanse, or sanctify for the purification of the sanctification of the flesh, how much more should we learn the power that God's given us through the blood? Oh, Jesus Christ. And quit listening to this accusing, finger-pointing, lying, deceitful devil that won't want you to know because he knows that he can keep you not knowing or keep you, keep you ignorant of what God has done through the not just the blood but the precious blood. How oh, Jesus, you know what it does? It guarantees you an audience with God. Whether you feel chills or not, you've got an audience with God. And God's mercy belongs to you and God's grace is yours and you're able to stand in the presence of God. Amen. You know what? I made a mistake. There you go again. I didn't come here to make you condemnation conscious. I didn't come down here to talk to you how guilty you are. I came to tell you that if you wanted Amen. Jesus, you are not guilty. Amen. You are free Amen. of the blood. Amen. Amen. Right. Well, so-and-so's book, that's another problem a lot of people's got. They're reading too many books and not the real book. Amen. I 
got a little cold way that felt pretty good in you get uh, yeah, praise God. This precious Jesus. Yeah, precious Jesus. Went to the cross. Nailed to the tree. Suffered. Wept. Bled. Died. And everything that he did on that tree was important. If you would take a close examination of this body hanging on that tree, and the only, the only way you can do it is by studying the Word and God knowledge because He's not there anymore, really. Amen. Only to those that believe. That preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to you and I that say this the power of God. When I need power, all I've got to do is go study every little detail of what He did on the cross. They hit him, sir. You ever had a bruise? Anybody ever, ever had a bruise? A bruise is an injury where the blood is so dispersed under the skin, it comes to the surface or underneath the skin and no farther, and it does not come out, but leaves evidence that there has been a severe blow struck. If you would look at his body close, you would see that on his body were places where somebody hid him. And it wouldn't mean much to those that serve God only because of convenience, because they wouldn't care. But to you, it really won't to know. Those bruises forgave every iniquity that you had. The wounds in his hands and his feet, the hole in his side, the wounds around his head from the crown of thorns, his hair matted with blood. Those wounds were for our transgression. Come on here just a minute. And he who knew no sin had never committed sin became sin and nailed my sin and your sin to his cross. I'm talking legal things here now. I'm talking things that will make the powers of hell tremble. Took your sins and nailed them to the cross in his own body. Took the law, lived it perfectly, went to the cross and had never done a wrong, never committed sin. Are you listening? I'm going to show you some things. I'm going to show you some, just a few things among many things that we need to know. Why we can approach the throne where he is. How we can get to where he is. Why we're allowed in there where he is. And then maybe, just maybe, you'll tell that voice that tells you you're not worthy, that you're that that God doesn't. Just maybe you'll stand up to it and say, "Get out of my face! Get out of my ears! Get out of my way! I'm going to God not because I'm holy. I can't get holy enough to get there." But you can't get mean enough to stop me from getting that devil. I'm not going through my righteousness. I'm going through Jesus' righteousness. I'm going through his blood. He had never committed sin. He had never committed wrong. The cross and the throne. Listen to this. He had never committed a wrong. He had never spoken a wrong. He went to the cross and offered a perfect sacrifice, his body. The only way into death, the only way you could get into death was to sin. And the wages of sin is death. But there were millions.
billions, billions trapped in a place called death, in a thing called death. Someone had to be able to go in there. But it wasn't just enough to go in there. Somebody had to be able to come back out of there. When Jesus went to that cross, Satan was preparing through his blindness, preparing the celebration how he had stopped this one, nailed to the cross, hung on the tree. I just wonder how Satan must have felt when the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. I'll get into that tomorrow night. I just wonder what Satan must have thought when Jesus was in his final death throes. He was in his final struggle. When he that was in him and with him came out of him on the cross and tore the veil and he that was on the cross by his spirit went to the heart of the earth. I just wonder how Satan must have felt. Please listen to this. This is powerful and this is, this is important. Amen. Please understand. Please listen closely. It took me 21 years to do this. What I Satan must have felt when that little head bowed, slumped to one side, and the voice has spoken, it is finished. And Jesus went in to a place called death. A place that he did not deserve. Because he had done nothing to deserve it. He blowed a hole in death. A spiritual hole. How do you think Satan must have felt when all of a sudden in that region of death where only sin could bring him? One who had never sinned was there. <laughs> One who had never committed a wrong was there. And in Romans chapter 6, the Bible teaches us this question. He that is dead is free from sin. Listen to this. He became my sin, your sin. He became your substitute. Please, you know, some of you are not paying attention. Listen to this closely. You think you don't need this? You are going to have to have this. Amen. Because God has shown me that there's a people coming behind the veil. I'll preach on it tomorrow night. And they're going to become the most powerful people in the face of this earth. And you're going to have to know how to get there. And what gives you the privilege and the right to get there. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus was in a place, he was in death and didn't deserve it. He had not sinned. He died and became my sin and your sin. He became my curse and yours. And yet he still had his holiness. He still had his righteousness. He still had his pureness. Because he had not committed sin. And the moment, is this, the moment he became my sin and yours, my curse and yours, bowed his head, gave up the ghost, men didn't kill him, he laid his life down. The moment he entered into death, the moment he died, God, the moment he died, he became free from what he had become for me. It was as though he had never been sin and yet he was but now he was free he could have come out of there anytime he wanted to but he said he would stay there a prescribed time but the chains were broken isn't this he loosed the pains of sin and death isn't this he tasted death for every one of us. Yes, he did. Amen. 
He became our death. Please listen closely. He became our sacrifice and our substitute. See, you got to know this. You'll never get anything from the throne when he that's on it until you understand what he did on the cross and the things he purchased. Satan wants to keep us religious because religion is not powerful. He wants to keep us traditional. Preachers today have, have an awesome task. We've got to go beyond all the bickering and the backering and the quarreling and the little clicks here and the little clicks there and one sitting over there wondering where she got the way to buy that new bread. And somehow or another get amongst all of them and bring peace to the congregation. It's a task that is beyond your imagination. And somehow or another manage to get in tune with God to bring the flow into that river. The only hope that anybody's got to be in touch and healed and delivered. Somebody say amen. amen. When he went into that place, he stayed there. He became our death. He became our substitute and our sin. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. Oh, I want you to watch this. I want you to know this. I want you to understand this. I want you to, 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 to legally understand that the moment that he became free from what he had become for us, then he also made it possible for me to be free. Yeah. And when you go to an altar, see, people don't understand the plan of salvation. When you go to an altar, we have so, we've got such a customary thing of going to an altar and the preacher's tail lights ain't out of sight on the car till we're back so hit. Preacher. I just went because everybody wanted me to. But it's only when you know why he did what he did and who he did what he did for. Till your heart busts inside and your heart breaks. And you begin to realize that you're pierced in your soul and you are pricked in your heart because a man that didn't deserve what he got went there in hell. And when you go to an altar, the very word altar means the place where your direction changes. It's more than just going down to a beach. You are so moved in your spirit you are so touched in your heart that you go to that altar because you begin to realize what he did for you. The altar is the place, watch this please, it means the place of death. In the eyes of God, if you were sincere when you went to the altar, if you went to that altar and your heart was convicted and you were convinced of sin, and you went to that altar and you humbled yourself and bowed yourself on that altar in the sight of God. That is where you died. Amen. If you just went to keep everybody off your back, then you don't know what I'm talking about. Right. But if your heart felt like it was trying to get up in your throat, and you couldn't stand to think about Jesus having to bleed and die to keep you out of hell. And all of a sudden you begin to realize somebody loved me and I didn't even know it. Praise God. Somebody helped me and I didn't even know it. And I, up to now I haven't even told him that I care. I haven't even let him know that I appreciate it. And you're so moved that when you, when the altar call is given, you are, you are carried, you are drawn Amen. to the place of your death. I can take you right now to Del Mar. It's really not even a church anymore. They built a bigger one and moved into another one. But I know the altar where I died. In the eyes of God that night when I humbled myself and bowed myself and laid on that altar, I went in another direction. And in the eyes of God and all his angels, I died. 
You'll never serve God till you die. Right. In the eyes of God, I am legally dead now. See, God's dealing with this inner man. This hidden man of the heart. This spirit man. This flesh gets blessed every now and then. Sometimes he blesses our socks off. If that spirit of Jesus is in you, it will even quicken your mortal body. Yeah, right. You can't help but get blessed off. We went to an altar. We humbled ourselves. We, we bowed down under his mighty hand. And there we died in God's sight. And then when you get up, it is no longer you that lives. Amen. It is Christ who lives in you. The hope. what's happened to you because you really don't know. How many of you have been going to church 50 years in Kentucky and don't even know where they died in the south? It's at the altar. See, the altar is where the sacrifice was put. The blood was poured out at the base of the altar, but the sacrifice of the body was burned on the altar. Damn. The altar stand. You know why there's so many whiners in church and so many complainers and grumblers? They ain't dead yet. Amen. Preacher. Has he preached you slime here or not? You hang around me, you'll die. I'll kill you. You just listen to this tape, I'm talking spiritual things. <laughs> you go to the altar and you die. Alright, when you go to the water, the water baptism is only a symbolic thing of something that's already happened. When you die, what's the next thing happens? Resurrection. You're buried? <laughs>
close mouthless unto his intelligence. Amen. That's it. Yes. You stand in that moment. You should have such a consciousness of what you're doing that you are proud to show the whole world that the person standing there ready to go down in that watery grave knows that he or she's already in the spiritual coffin. Amen. Ooh, God, I felt that honor to God. Hallelujah to God. Praise Him just a moment. Ooh, Lord, praise Him just a moment. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. God. Thank you, Lord. You show honor to God, the fullness of deity. When you go down and knowledge tells you, I'm doing this as an open action to show my spiritual thing. But I'm going down in this water and they'll pull me back up. But I want to show the world that I know where I've been. I've been down into his death. And that I've died with him. And that he has already made a way not just to get into death for me, but for me to go into his death so that I could go right by where he went to and look up and know that I have passed from death unto life. That I'm just going symbolically into his death. But in reality, yeah. I've passed death on the stretch, stretch. Yeah. I've honked my horn in praise. Yeah. Woo! And I have passed from death yeah. to life. Yeah. And I come up out of that grave. The old man's dead. Yeah. And I've showed the world. And I appreciate everybody for coming to my funeral. <laughs> Did you know that? You went to the altar and died. You went to the water and was buried. You came out of there. You went to a well. But cracked it last. And then. He began to walk in the newness of life. You get to work, you still got the same old grumpy boss. <laughs> same old factory. Same old hell raisers around you. Same old dirty joke tellers. Yeah. And it don't matter no more. Because you don't walk. Listen to this. You're in the same old life, walking in a new mess. And temptations come, and trials come, persecutions come, disappointments come, but you are dead. It tries to resurrect. It tries to control you. But you go back with tears in your eyes to the moment you fell over an altar and died and laid your life down. It's all right to cry because you're changed. You couldn't change yourself, but somebody met you there. You got up out of the altar and in the eyes of God, you were dead. You went Begin to learn 
God bless you that have found you a good Holy Ghost filled church and a preacher that will start teaching you the word of God and how to live thereby. When you get this knowledge, you begin to understand this, then the next time Satan jumps up in your face, you'll say they will work this time. Because of that, I lost my strength. I had to 